We have an incredible lineup of speakers um, and panels over the course of this weekend, with activists participating both in person and online from across the globe but with particular focus uh, with guests from the Indian Pacific region. Before I go any further, I want to acknowledge that we meet on the lands of the Wadjuk Noongar Nation. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land, land never ceded. And in paying our respects to elders past and present, we also pledge our active support to the ongoing struggle for treaty and sovereignty, yeah. for, for genuine justice for the First Nations people. My name is Janet Parker. I'm a member of Socialist Alliance. I'm a member of Friends of Palestine WA, and I'm a founding member of Jews for Palestine WA. Tonight's panel is titled, From the River to the Sea, Palestine Will Be Free. Well, for many of us here tonight, the campaign against Israel's genocidal war against Palestine has consumed our waking hours for more than, for, for near on nine months. We have seen its devastating impact unfold on our screens every minute, every hour, every day. And in response, we have seen unparalleled growth in the global solidarity movement. Amidst this growth of support has been an awakening of an ever increasing number of Jews saying, Israel does not speak for us, who recognize that the same process of dehumanization that created the environment of the slaughter of six million Jews is being used to justify the mass slaughter of Palestinian peoples today. Well, tonight I am very proud to introduce a panel of speakers uh, to, ad to address a whole myriad of questions relating to Palestine uh, and the, the struggle for freedom. Many of them, all of them, have had a prominent role in fighting for a free Palestine. First up, we have Khaled Ghanam, who is a Palestinian activist, an author, a writer and journalist, and a member of Socialist Alliance, who is based in Gadigal, Sydney. Thanks, Khaled. Hi, everyone. I'm very happy to talk with you now. And this is very important to us uh, as a Palestinian to tell you like we are doing a lot of things in Palestine to keep the people united. And uh, our ma major demand is ceasefire now. That's what we, all the people, want in Palestine. I'm working with a lot of people to give them medicine or food, sometimes smuggling it from tunnels, sometimes we do it f with some help of the good Israeli, and sometimes with uh, some Arab regimes. And that's maybe not enough to make the people survive, but that's what we can do, and I'm encouraging everyone, if he have any or she have any resources, to give the people some support to keep their solidarity there. Is This is very important. And I can say something very important. The Palestinian inside Israel, we call them the Palestinian who's still in Haifa and Al Jalil and Yafa, they are doing a great role to help Gaza people, and even the Palestinian in Eastern Jerusalem and West Bank. For that, we have the major things for us today is from river to the sea. And many people ask me, like, can you do a research and tell us the roots of this uh, river to the sea, from where it came? And I will read for you what I, what I found. In March 1928, the Socialist Worker Association in Haifa Board announced that the future of Palestine from the river to the sea would only be achieved by establishing a Palestinian state with equal rights between Jews and Arab. This is the first time 
this word mentions. After Nakba, I mean 1948, the Arab regimes banned any connection between the Palestinian inside Israel and the Palestinian and refugee camps. And that means we cannot talk with our cousin who is like in Haifa or, or in any part of Israel. But in 1962, the Palestinian writer Ghassan Kanafani broke the decision to prevent communication with the Palestinian inside Israel and demand, demand the necessity of unifying Palestinian afford from the river to the sea in order to, liber to liberate Palestine. Ghassan Kanafani is one of founder of Popular Front for the liberation of Palestine. And this is very important for us where we started from the modern revolution, Palestinian revolution. And as we know, the major speaker for tonight is Layla Khalid. And Layla Khalid is well known for us as a hero, more than a leader. Um, when I was five years old, I met her in Ain Al Hilwa, which is in southern Lebanon. It is Ain Al Hilwa refugee camp. And I was just four. And it was like mid 1970s. And we asked her, Are you going to liberate Palestine? <laughs> and what she said, well, you need to be with us, all the, because I was with my friends, we are all children, and she said, all of you need to be armed and go and fight Israel, keep yourself united. This hero we love, and we, we, we take her word, and we work in her word till now, because be, without people united, we cannot, we cannot win. And that's like the major things we learn from Layla Khalid and from all our elder and the revolution. And uh, I don't want to talk more about Layla Khalid more than she's like inspiring lady. When you talk with her in person, she give you this feeling you are part of the revolution, wherever you are. When you talk with Layla Khalid, you will meet a lot. When she, when she, when she is talking, always with, she, when we are young, there is a lot of Eastern European members with her, and she said it's not just Palestinian need to fight; it's worldwide fight. All the comrades around the world need to fight for Palestine because Palestine matter for all the comrades around the world. Be united. Thank you. That was, um, that was an, a good introduction for Layla. Um, so next we have our iconic uh, Palestinian revolutionary activist, Layla Khalid, so powerful, a symbol of the struggle, that the Australian government uh, were unwilling to give her a visa. They uh, had labelled her a terrorist and decided that she was uh, not worthy of... Um, of attending our conference or um, entering Australia. As a result, she joins us online. Layla is a member of the National Committee of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine and a representative of the Palestine National Council. Thank you, Layla. I am overwhelmed to be with you in this event, which is a very important one. I have to say from the beginning, Gaza is screaming and shouting out of killing their children and women. At the same time, they are still patient enough to bear all the atrocities that the Israeli army and state, their government is an apartheid government before the war. This is the sixth war against Gaza. 
and our people sacrifice with everything. Their children now are killed. The parents are killed. We have about 17,000 child children who has no parents. And now we don't know what to do with them. Maybe they will not be alive because Israel targeted, targeted by intent that they want to kill three generations. The grandfather, the son or the daughter, and the grandchildren. Can you imagine what a brutal war? All wars are brutal, except the revolution. It's a legal thing for human beings. When there is oppression, there should be a resistance. Because human beings cannot uh, live with oppression. This is a human thing. Hitler was in, in history, but what history he wrote for us? Killing, making uh, gas uh, furnaces. Not only for the Jews, I know that it is the Holocaust, but also peoples of the European countries and the Soviet Union. That I remember, I know that the Soviet Union paid 22 million casualties. And also, fifth of Poland uh, population were killed by the Nazis. But at the same time, there was resistance. This gives us a lesson that don't accept oppression in any phase of it, because we have different kinds of oppression. It's a class oppression. It's a human, unhuman oppression. But at the same time, there is resistance. And this is an obligation for people oppressed. In the Charter of the United Nations, item 8, says people under oppression or occupation uh, have the right to resist by all means, including armed struggle. We are called by the West and the United States and other countries that we are terrorists. Who is the terrorist? Occupation is the peak of terrorism. This we have to know it very well, not only by name, but also by the details of occupation. So, now I'm here to tell you that we were very much my people inside Palestine, especially in Gaza, in the West Bank, in 1948, and in diaspora. We are grateful to you. We have seen you taking the streets to say, from the river to the sea, Palestine must be free. This gives us the strength of solidarity. And we have seen that in different countries. This means that the whole world began to understand and realize that what is occupation and what is Zionism. Because I know that there are Jews. They say, not in our name, this is a long time ago, not now only, that we have seen them. Jews were living with us in Palestine, and they were Palestinians. Like when they came from Europe, they had their uh, nationality according to the country they are there. Judaism is a religion, and religion is not considered uh, nationality. Because uh, Muslims are one million, 
they are from different nationalities. One billion, I say. Billion. But Christianity is all over the world. So we have to understand the realities of this occupation. All the time, the Zionist movement declared from the beginning, a land without people to a people without a land. They meant that Palestine <laughs> wasn't inhibited by people. And they, as Jews, they had to come to Palestine because they were promised by God. Can we uh, turn back to history? God is not an, uh, having a, an agency for real estate. God is for all people who believe in. I believe in God. The same as uh, the Christians, the same as the Jews. We believe in God. But I tell you that a, a neighbor in Haifa, where we lived uh, before Nakba, in 1948, she was a Jew. And I had a friend called Tamara. So I tried all the time we uh, play together. I was four years old, but I remember Tamara. I tried to find her. Unfortunately, I couldn't. Through the media, I was uh, calling Tamara, my uh, friend there. I really missed her. When my mother uh, tried to take us to Lebanon because her family is there, it was, uh, was uh, April. And in April 9th, uh, the uh, Zionist gangs, militias, were attacking and they made the first massacre in their Yassin. This is the first massacre. And other massacres also followed by them, supported by the Britain, British mandate to give them the uh, arms to fight us. Our people fought. Many of them were hanged at the time of the British mandate in Palestine after the Second World War. So it was uh, a project that needs someone to be in this region in the Middle East and to divide the Arab countries as well. So it was this time to be uh, promised by the British, uh, the British Minister of the Foreign Affairs. And he promised the Jews to build a homeland for them in Palestine. Unfortunately, at that time, in after the Second World War, and they used the uh, tortures by uh, the Nazis, and uh, all the time. They were speaking about the Nazis who made Holocaust and so on. Okay, this we know by uh, uh, studying uh, uh, history. But what happened after that? They really came by the help of the British and the French and the Germans because those and other European countries on top of them was the United States. It's because it's a colonial state in our region, and especially uh, Palestine, because it's on the crossroads for from Asia to Africa and to Europe. So it's a, a colonial state, which was a, a, a in 1948, accepted as a state in the United Nations on condition to accept the return of the people who were kicked out of Palestine to their homeland and to their uh, 
properties. But Israel did not abide by international law since that time until now. Because they, <laughs> because the uh, United Nations had a resolution 181 that calls for the division of Palestine in two states. One, and that was in 1947. Of course, the Palestinians and the Arabs did not accept that resolution, but the balance of forces was not with us. It was with the uh, uh, colonial system, wherever it is, in, in Europe, mostly from Europe and the United States. They were having a strategy, and this is the Zionist movement itself that called for controlling the world by money and to control the economy of the world. What do you see now? They are controlling. Yes, this is the Zionist movement. And when they had the 33 uh, Congress co conference in Basel to celebrate 100 years with uh, uh, the uh, uh, initiated the at the uh, Zionist movement. After 100 years, they went back to, uh, uh, to evaluate what they did in 100 years. And yes, they said, we have occupied uh, Jerusalem, uh, uh, Palestine, all Palestine in 1967, but we were late to establish the uh, seven months since November, when the United Nations decided by a resolution 181 to divide to divide Palestine in two states, one Jewish one and the other Arabic one. But the Arabic one did not uh, was not uh, implemented. Only the Jewish state, and they didn't say what kind of a state. Israel, uh, when in this conference they said. It's only because we didn't establish the state in November after this, uh, after this resolution. It uh, came out in May 15. Imagine that from that time they were planning to occupy our land and not to keep us there under their rule as all colonialists do, but they wanted to evacuate Palestine from its people. That's why Australia government will not give me a visa to speak about this history because they feel that they is like Israel. It's a, a state of occupation and apartheid. And I read about Australia because I studied history. So I know what happened to the indigenous people in Australia. And uh, uh, still Australia under the, the British crown. I think that this history will tell us those governments with whom they make allies are our people look upon our government, uh, other governments, the first measure for us is what is the attitude towards our struggle? And at the same time to know what links with Israel. So we can decide if we want to make relation with some governments. It means that we will not find any government that will accept our doctrine, our dream of a people and the, a people who is struggling 100 years ago since Belfort Declaration. 
So it means, and we were, uh, our people, our ancestors were fighting there. But according to the balance of forces, at that time, it wasn't for us. We were kicked out and Israel was established on our, uh, and our society was also destroyed. But I tell you that even with that Nakba, Nakba means in Arabic means catastrophe. We are united people until now, since we were dispersed in the whole world. And many of uh, our people went to the camps in Arab countries, in some Arab countries. And they couldn't uh, uh, make us as if we are only uh, ref refugees that need uh, uh, human aids. In Palestine itself, there are also uh, uh, refugees camps in the West Bank and in Gaza. In Gaza, 85% of the people are refugees from different cities and villages around Gaza, from Yaffa and other uh, other. Uh, I will not say now, I'm not uh, in a university to speak about in, uh, history. But history uh, gives us lessons. The first lesson that we should be united, whatever happens. And this, our people proved it since we were kicked out of Palestine. <laughs> there were many massacres outside Palestine. I just want to remember to remind you of Sabra and Shatila massacre when Israel launched a war against Lebanon and they uh, occupied, even they went to uh, Beirut, the uh, capital of Lebanon, of Lebanon, because they don't want to see the witness. Even they don't want to hear our voices, but your voices are higher than the, uh, their uh, bombs. I'm sure human beings can use their voices to show their solidarity. And you are part of the ones who uh, express their solidarity for Palestine, not only for Gaza, but because it is now in Gaza. It's genocidal state. They like to kill even their uh, uh, army. Some of them were complaining that we cannot continue like this because we don't see who, who we are fighting. They know very well that it's the Palestinian resistance. And Israel wanted to say it's only Hamas that we are fighting. But this is, uh, <laughs> this is not the truth. They are lying. It's the Palestinian resistance. Also. Resistances in Arab countries worked hard. In Lebanon, with Hezbollah, and in Yemen, they closed the Red Sea for trade for Israel, and this is a way to support the struggle of the Palestinians. And to the atrocities that they see it, every day, every day, they kill, kill, kill. And this government is an, uh, an apartheid government. It's uh, the, the worst ugly state happened after the Second World War. They came by force. They killed many of our people in different places, in different uh, uh, villages. They killed uh, people in, in all Palestine. And they won that war, and they let us go out. Now, in Gaza, they know very well that the people will stay in their, in their land, on their land. And this makes them angry. This makes them to be more uh, uh, animal-wise. These are not 
human beings, unhuman. They wanted to learn from the Nazis how to kill people. Why? They shouldn't have done that. Our people received the migrants from Germany. There are many videos about that. They brought for them the bread and the water when they came tired from coming by boats to Palestine. But we were yani, not following up what the uh, plan when they came to Palestine. They thought that there are no people. Now, they know that there is a people. A people who struggles and united in everywhere from Australia to Palestine. And this is our pride. We are proud that we can talk to you. We are grateful to you because you told us that we'd like to invite you to our conference. Okay, the government doesn't accept, but there are there is the technology now that we can, can I meet you and speak to you. I'm not going to be, uh, to take all the time, but I tell you that whatever you did, it gives us the, the strength, the power that we will be victorious. It's because of you and other peoples of the world. Thank you very much. Continue, continue to support oppressed people wherever they are. Don't forget that we have lost now about 100,000 people in nine months, mostly children and men. I again, on behalf of my people and on behalf of Gaza, all and Palestine, and on, on behalf of my party, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. I tell you that we will be victorious because you are supporting us. Thank you very much. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. From the sea to the river, Palestine will be forever. Thank you very much, Layla. Um, as always, you have been a huge inspiration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker tonight is Salim Vali, South African human rights activist, a South Africa's National Research Foundation's Chair in Community Worker and Adult Education, based at the University of Johannesburg. Salim. Please, come up. Long live Leila Khalid, long live. Long live. Viva Leila Khalid, viva. Viva. A really warm embrace to my young comrade, Leila Khalid. <laughs> and we remember her late husband who left us Hisham, a comrade, last year. And thank you for this wonderful gathering to the hardworking members of Socialist uh, Alliance, Khaled and uh, Janet. Um, I bring you greetings from South Africa, our solidarity movement there, and the different organizations. And I need to start by saying that Israel's crimes are so heinous, it's inhumanity, so callous and disturbing, and Palestinian suffering so intolerable, and the UN so paralyzed that people around the world are increasingly rising in outrage. This level of global solidarity, students on hundreds of campuses around the world demanding 
divestment, workers refusing to handle goods and arms to and from Israel, cultural workers and sports people condemning and boycott, boycotting events with Israeli participation, communities declaring apartheid-free zones, and even countries taking tentative steps to impose sanctions on Israel. Namibia has stopped sending their diamonds to Israel for beneficiation. Colombia has stopped coal exports to Israel. Malaysia has stopped allowing Israeli uh, ships to port. And this level was last witnessed during the struggle against apartheid South Africa. And the momentum is on our side. I need to say that there have been moments in modern history where the world became galvanized to act in solidarity with people in struggle. It happened with the Spanish people against fascism, with the people of the world against American imperialism in Indochina and in support of the Vietnamese, with the struggle of the people of Southern Africa against white minority rule. And this is the moment for Palestine. I think there is a qualitative change that the present genocide of Palestinians is really the wet dream of the fascist right in Israel and elsewhere. They have long argued for, as comrade Khalid says, finishing the Nakba. Without any irony, there are senior politicians in Israel who talk about the final solution. We heard that before. And I don't want to talk about Itamar Ben Gavir or Ividor Moaz or Smotrich. They have exposed the nature of Israeli society. For a long time, liberals throughout the world were telling us that it is the only democracy in the Middle East. Of course, they prevent real democracy from taking root in the Middle East. They have always sided with the autocrats, the author authoritarians, the monarchs, the despots of the Arab world in preventing genuine democracy. They've told us that they want a two-state solution. They've told us that they are for peace. It's just the terrorists we are opposed to. That mask has been ripped from their faces. We can see the real nature of Israel, Israeli society today. Those old tropes about the only democracy in the Middle East, etc., were always more fiction than reality. Many of us knew that Israeli democracy has always been a deception, an oxymoron. And while I agree that the Israeli government represents continuity in the political development of the Zionist project, there is a caveat. Last year at a lecture at SOAS in March, many months before October, I said that while Israel has always been a settler colonial apartheid state maintained through military rule and apartheid, we needed to be very concerned that under 
the current Israeli government, I said this in March last year, the situation would not just go from bad to worse. And you've heard, Leila, from the establishment of Israel, there have been massacres. Dir Yassin is one. There have been many others. There's been uh, uh, Sabra and Shatila, and so on and so on over the past eight decades. But at a certain point, this quantitative change would become qualitative. This is what I said. And the assessment was based on Netanyahu's government and also that extreme right-wing genocidaires, people who support arch-fascists like Mia Kahani and uh, other mass murderers um, were in power responsible for key areas such as security and building settlements. And so what happened in the past almost eight months, going on nine, did not come as a surprise. No one, none of us, were prepared for the level of cruelty and deplorable depravity, even if Israel has been doing this from time to time over the past eight decades. But we've seen examples every day there's been a massacre, whether it's Al-Akhli Baptist Hospital, where 400 people were killed, whether it's Nasariat right now, recently, whether it's Al-Shifa Hospital, the mass graves they've been finding all over, the situation with people like Hind, that horrible situation, the only survivor in a car with her family phoning the, uh, for help, ambulance services coming, killing her and people in the ambulance who came to rescue her. Many other atrocities and massacres every day for almost nine months. We know that. We know that uh, the rank, regular bombing sprees over the 17 years that Gaza was under medieval siege went before this particular uh, genocide. We know that every university in Gaza has been bombed. Almost a hundred full professors killed, four professors, uh, university presidents, more UN aid workers than in any time of their history. The number of medical people, of journalists, close to 6,000 students, and I can go on. Besides this destruction, there is famine, there is starvation, there are illnesses, and there are hundreds of thousands of people who are at immediate risk. If you look at the number of people killed in this population in Gaza of 2.3 million, the 40,000 men, women, and children, of course, as we know, 70% women and children, those who have been maimed for life, those who are under the rubble, and just look at the number of children, 21,000 children killed, including those under the rubble, 19,000 orphans, and the UN, just released a horrible statistic in the past four days where there are 21,000 children missing. But just with 
the number of people killed and injured and under the rubble, that's the equivalent of over 1.5 million Australians. I mean, think about that number. And it was clear for some time that this government, the Israeli government, had, a, had genocidal intent. They've said this on many occasions. And they were unencumbered by what is called international opinion, meaning Western opinion. And that the horrors they uh, have unleashed has created distinct challenges for the Palestinian resistance and movements of international solidarity, but also opportunities. The only reason why Palestinians continue to exist, and this is not rhetoric, it's because of their resistance. And for nine months, despite the horror, the resistance has stood firm and continue fighting. All Israel can do is kill more and more civilians. And in terms of what we're seeing around the world, this is an inflection point, the South African moment. And sanctions are now on the cards. And I want to remind people, because there are many solidarity movements where we recognize the extent of the horror, of the savagery, the brutality. And we are stunned when people go about their everyday lives. And it's all too human to despair. But it's only because of the hard work over decades, sometimes with small groups, that finally things begin to change qualitatively. And this is the situation we are in now. A few years ago, we could never recognize the gains we've made in the past year or so. We are still very far from that South African moment. But it's very clear that in the 80s, we also felt that the world abandoned us. There was Ronald Reagan. There was Margaret Thatcher. Um, but it was really grassroots work of women's organizations, students' organizations, trade unions, the waterside workers refusing to offload South African ships, students protesting, uh, etc., faith-based groups, progressive faith-based groups. And, you know, it was an accumulation of these actions that push the Olympics, FIFA, uh, sporting codes, cultural events, and it was through the boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaign. And that campaign is in line with international law. It's not revolutionary. It's not asking people to give up their lives, to pick up a gun. No. It's asking people to stand for international humanitarian law. Solidarity is not charity, in the words of Samara Machal. It is allies acting on different terrains for the same goals. This is what has happened since the Spanish Revolution or Spanish fight against fascism up to now. And we are saying that we should not give up. Israel, their supporters always talk about why are we singled out. They always use the what about argument. What about this country or the other? And of course, during the struggle against apartheid South Africa, 
we had the same thrown at us. Remember, Paul Pot existed at that time. The number of people he killed was far in, in terms of numbers more than South Africans that the apartheid regime killed. But they don't understand that BDS is a tactical weapon, that Pol Pot already isolated himself. Israel is pampered and privileged by the West. People who should know better, the ruling class of this country, who have a lot to atone for in terms of racism and what they've done to the indigenous people. Similarly, the genocides that Germany has a force onto people, not only in Germany, but also Namibia, by the way, and other parts of the world. And it's the same people, like the American ruling class, that are doing this. This is racism. When we took Israel to the ICJ, it was also confronting the issue of international law, which was established after the Second World War, after Nazi Germany. And the West was in the dock, not just Israel. The judges were in the dock. International law was in the dock. And it's very clear to us, we spoke for the majority world. And I think that this is not the time to despair this is the time to step up our work, to increase our solidarity. And for us in South Africa, who gave the world the word apartheid, over the past few years, it was unthinkable five years ago, it's something South Africans and Palestinians knew for a long time, that apartheid existed in Israel, despite the propaganda of the mainstream Western media, and of course your gift to the world, Murdoch and company. <laughs> we knew better, and today there's not a single reputable human rights organization that thinks otherwise. Whether it's Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, Israeli Human Rights Group, Beth Salem, Al Haq from Palestine, but we knew this a long time ago. We also knew from reports from people from South Africa who went there and came back, like Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who was considered, you know, the conscience of the world, that the situation is much worse than what we experience in Palestine. I just gave an interview. I explained why. But despite all of that, we take the words of Francesca Albanese, that's an Albanese I really like, <laughs> who says that we need to go beyond the apartheid framework. Because quite often the, that framework doesn't consider Palestinians in the diaspora. Six to seven million of them, including Khaled and others. And the right to return has to feature in our work for Palestinian freedom. That's absolutely necessary. And I need to say that the Zionists throughout the world are becoming desperate, so don't worry about them. <laughs> we will continue our work. In every part of the world, they understand things are changing, and their lies and fabrications, their hasbara, their violence, their terror doesn't work any longer. The canard, the canard that if you are opposed to Israel, you are anti-Semitic, doesn't hold any water any longer. And the way to deal with Zionists is not to cower is not to pander to them, but it's to directly confront them and their racism, their genocide, their terror. Young people around the world 
This does not work any longer. More and more people, including heartwarmingly, many, many young anti-Zionist Jews in our country, in the US, in this country, and elsewhere. They see through the lie, and they are our allies. I think Janet, Janet told me 10 minutes ago that I have five minutes left. So I'm going to have to stop. But I would like to say that simultaneously with the genocide, and part of the genocide is ecocide, is scholasticide, it's reproductive genocide. It's the targeting of women, of children, of the means of life, of medical facilities, of hospitals, of the 20-odd thousand Palestinian women who are pregnant, all of that. It's infanticide, the number of children killed. It's the number of housing. I mean, 85% of people's residences, domesticide. But I think it's also all these struggles that the left progressive forces stand for, uh, climate justice, against patriarchy, the indigenous people of the world, um, the question of the purpose of education, all of this comes together. And this is a movement, Palestinian solidarity and the BDS movement that we all need to be part of despite being involved in different issues. Israel is a threat to humankind. Besides white phosphorus and dime bombs and things that get field tested on the bodies of men, women, and children and then get exported around the world and the value of those weapons of destruction increases because they point to how they're controlling the Palestinians not any longer. It remains a threat because it has nuclear weaponry. And uh, they have said they are prepared to use that. So Israel, Palestinians are on the front line and a Palestinian Australian Adam Hania said it's not just the depth of the suffering and the length of the time. It is also the role Palestinians play in the front line of the struggle against genocidal Israel and their supporters, the arm manufacturers, the fossil fuel companies, the oil companies, the high-tech security, the spyware companies, and American and Western imperialism. And therefore, they play an important, pivotal role in the global struggle against capitalism and against imperialism. Amandla, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. From the sea to the river, Palestine will live forever. Thank you. Thank you, Salim. That was amazing um, and very inspirational and very thorough. Um, I'm glad you went for longer than, than we initially discussed. Um, our next speaker tonight is Nasser Mashni, um, who will be known to many uh, here as he recently spoke at a public meeting in Perth. Um, and of course, for those who didn't make it to that public meeting. NASA lights up our Instagram screens every day, pretty much, um, to tell us, um, to, to speak with us about Palestine and the struggles of the Palestinians. 
NASA is president of the Australian Palestine Advocacy Network, uh, also known as APAN, and long-term fighter for justice and the self-determination and self-determination for the Palestinian people. Um, he's joining us online. NASA, thank you. Thank you all so very much. I, I would have loved to have been with you, but it's it's such a long way to get get across this continent. Um, I, I one of my heroes uh, is on this um, on this panel, Leila Khalid. She stepped away from the camera, so I might save my that for a little bit later. But firstly, thank you for everyone for attending and for all you do. I'm coming to you with some very good news. Great news. I've come from the future. Israel doesn't celebrate its 100th birthday. It just celebrated its 76th. It will not. It will not celebrate 100. And it will not celebrate 100 because, because of each and every one of you, because of the international movement for the liberation of Palestine, and with that, the liberation of all oppressed peoples. Palestine is an exemplar. It's an exemplar of resistance for all people. If you tear a Palestinian into pieces, each of those pieces would resist. It's ingrained in every piece of our DNA as a Palestinian. It's ingrained, in fact, in every indigenous person's DNA. It's not only in our will, in the will of indigenous people, but also the will of all of the people of this earth who want to see us all liberated. The Nakba may have scattered us all over the world, but wherever we went, we resisted, we advocated, we taught, we organized. Even if they sent Palestinians to another planet, we would find a way to resist. Zionists wanted to liquidate our cause. They did so um, when, they, uh, when, when, our, when our resistors and our fighters like Leila, Leila Khalid, in the 60s and 70s, they wanted to liquidate our cause, they wanted to liquidate us as people, whether it was in the 30s or the 40s, in, in Beirut in 82 and onwards, now in Gaza in 2023. Zionists have failed and they'll never succeed. We were born in Palestine, we were Palestinian, we are Palestinian, we will always be Palestinian and Palestine will be free from the river to the sea, in our lifetimes, my friends, Israel will not make a hundred. As we know, uh, our hero Leila was denied the opportunity to come here because this, this settler colonial, this racist country denied her a visa, yet gave a visa to Doron Almog, an Israeli general who has been committed of, uh, um, has been charged with crimes against humanity and war crimes in his actions as an Israeli general in the 2000s in Lebanon. He was given a visa, he gave a speaking tour across this continent with no qualms or anything. It's unsurprising, for it should not surprise anyone, excuse me, that Australia denied a visa for Leila, but gave a visa for this war criminal. Because as Malcolm Turnbull said, our former Prime Minister, when Benjamin Netanyahu visited this continent uh, some eight years ago, we're like-minded countries. And what he was talking about was like-minded in the fact that they were liberal democracies and they were free countries and they respected human rights. But what it actually means is they're like-minded in their oppressive systems of an indigenous people, the fact they stole land from their indigenous people, the fact that they continue to oppress and occupy indigenous people and kill and murder and starve them in Gaza, West Bank, in 48, in historic Palestine, and here in the racist colonial um, incarceration rates, in youth detention, in childs getting taken away. The world, as Salim was saying, has seen, has seen Zionism for what it is. The mask is truly off. There is no going back. You cannot unsee what we have seen, and we have seen now in our youth encampments the future of a liberated Palestine. Those youth encampments that were from, from uh, our east coast all the way to our west coast, across this continent, but also all over the world, of tomorrow's leaders standing up for, in the face of a, 
a, a disproportionate power of students, of children, up against the institutions, the universities, fearing nothing, understanding what the risk was with respect to their educations, their future employment prospects, but also the cost of their educations, unvowed and unconquered, energised, energised by the resistance of the Palestinians in Gaza that have not been broken, a guerrilla army that has withstood, withstood for nine months the brutality of a nuclear armed state aided and abetted militarily, diplomatically, and through a compliant media in trying to completely obliterate a people. The strength of those Palestinians in Gaza, the strength of Palestinians all over the world, the strength of our heroes like Leila Khalid continue to inspire not just Palestinians, but all people all over the world. More than half a million Israelis have left Israel since October 7. They know the project has failed and is going to fail. The economy is down in excess of 20%. The flight of capital is increasing. The downgrading of their economy by agencies like Moody, Moody's is happening. The boycott, divestment and sanction movement is continuing to grow. As we saw just most recently, um, Colombia, which supplied Israel with 60% of their coal, 60% of their coal in 2023 has stopped exporting coal to Israel. Um, most recently, uh, during the week, Spain denied access to Indian ships that were taking armaments to Israel. Um, the French have uh, confirmed that they will arrest Benjamin Netanyahu if he attends, uh, if he, uh, if the ICC was to issue an arrest warrant and he were to enter France. There will be a time many um, apartheid era white South Africans that left South Africa after Nelson Mandela got out of jail and went to the West, many of them to Perth, as, I, as you, many of you know, they were able to do that and say that they were against apartheid, quote unquote, against apartheid. We're not going to let, we're not going to let the Zionists forget who they are. As I was saying before, Israel is increasingly becoming that pariah. Could you imagine today taking a picture as a world leader with Benjamin Netanyahu? There won't be any state visits coming. And increasingly, as the ICJ and the ICC elevate the language, where we went from November to a possible genocide, January uh, at the ICJ, a plausible genocide. Francesca in March saying evidence of a genocide. Chris Sadoti, a UN Special Rapporteur on Palestine and Occupied Territories, last week saying that Israel is the most criminal army in the world, that there were 7,000 pieces of evidence, 7,000 individual verifiable pieces of evidence that prove that Israel is uh, is committing human rights uh, violations and crimes against humanity and breaking international law. There is no putting that milk back in the container. The end is nigh. Young Jews and increasingly older Jews are abandoning the concept of Zionism as it's becoming clearer to them that Zionism is racism, that Zionism is founded in a concept of supremacy and looks exactly like white supremacy, looks exactly like patriarchy, homophobia, and every form of hate. For years, Israel has been, um, has been a bedrock. The, the, the foundations of its uh, being the vassal state it is for Western empire was predicated on its military superiority. This has been laid to waste by the resistance in Gaza. Laid to waste. And when we talk about the, 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 just how much has been invested, a 24 seven conveyor belt of weaponry from the United States, whether it be battleships and nuclear armed submarines sitting off the coast of Gaza, whether it be um, the diplomatic attendance, whether it's Biden or um, Rishi Sunak or Macron or anyone visiting the state of Israel and all of the diplomatic um, overtures where Israel's got a right to defend itself and all the parliaments across the world holding minutes silence and lighting up buildings in there in the honor. All of that has meant nothing in the face of the strength, the strength, the termination, the unbreakability, the unconquerability of the Palestinian people as they continue to fight for their, their homeland. This 
uh, I'm going to say, I'm trying to think of a very, you know, uh, articulate word to describe. Piss weak army. This piss weak army of the Zionist enterprise has been exposed for exactly what it is. Exactly what it is. A, a, uh, a, an army of occupation, not an army of strength or heroes. The renewed vigour of our movement since October 7, the renewed vigour of our movement in our youth across the world has inspired a generation of young people, and I know so many that are there, uh, that will not, will not. This Gaza 23 has awoken a spirit in the Palestinian people throughout the world and its allies to ensure that we will not stop until we are free. There is no peace process. The talk of a peace process or of two states is long past. There is only one talk now. It's of a decolonized Palestine, of a liberated Palestine, of a, liber of a Palestine that is free from the river to the sea. This is how our, our conversation needs to be. And I welcome you all to the movement. I congratulate you all for everything you have done. I thank you all for everything you have done. And please, uh, I, I, I want you to all please join me because Layla is back now and thank her for her lifetime's work, her lifetime of sacrifice. She's a hero of liberation movement par excellence and without peer. Um, thank you very much, Layla, and thank you for coming and thanks uh, for, for giving me the opportunity to be on this panel. Free Palestine from the river to the sea, everybody will be free. Thank you very much, Nasa. I want to thank, I want, I would like you again to thank all our speakers. Unfortunately, Layla has gone. I've got, um, just before we do um, uh, sort of, you know, relax and have something to drink and eat, I just wanted a couple of, there are a couple of announcements. Um, the first one is, I, I really wanted to make a really strong plug for Green Left um, tonight. Green Left is a, a people-powered media. Uh, it aims to provide a much-needed forum for discussion and debate about changing the world. It gives a voice to progressive ideas, it links issues, campaigns and activists, and lets people know how they can join with others to take action for change. As a grassroots publication, it thrives on your support. We don't have a paywall because we want it to be accessible to everybody, but for those who can contribute, we encourage you to do so. Without it, we can't survive. For just $5 a month, you can get Green Left direct to your inbox twice monthly, um, and the first month is for free. And for just $10 a month, you can get digital and print, inbox and mailbox, uh, with the first month free. So um, you can, there is a solidarity cost in there as well. If you, if you look at our, uh, get a copy of our newspaper on the way out and, and have a look at the subscription rates, incredibly cheap, but a valuable, invaluable uh, tool for all activists. Oh, Nasa, are you wanting to go? Hey. <laughs> Sorry. I, thought, I, 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 felt sure, I felt sure you'd want to hear our announcements. Well, I was really excited. I can't, I, I'm, I'm a subscriber. Everyone else should subscribe. It's well worth the money. Thanks, oh, nice. Everyone. Thanks, thanks That's what me. we needed, a plug from NASA. Thank you, NASA. Good night. Good night, everyone.